My name is Andy Jones. I'm the CEO of Ramsey here in the UK. Ramsey Healthcare is a global provider of healthcare. We operate in 11 countries, employing 77,000 staff, and incredibly, we look after over 8 million patients a year. Ramsey Healthcare has been here in the UK for the last 12 years. We've now become the number one provider for NHS services, which means that GPs are able to choose Ramsey Hospitals to refer their patients for high quality healthcare. So Ramsey has got a long-standing set of values called the Ramsey Way. They really define who we are as an organisation, how we work together, how we look after patients, and ultimately it's all about people caring for people. We're very proud of the services that we provide, and that's largely due to teamwork and our staff. The difference that this makes for patients is really high quality healthcare in all of our hospitals and facilities. We've got an absolutely fantastic program called Speaking Up for Safety. It's all about training staff to be positive and to call out episodes in patients' care, particularly when they're concerned that things aren't going right. We've been able to grab this program and we're the first organisation in the UK to roll this program out. The future for Ramsey Healthcare is bright both globally and for us here in the UK. All of our units are accredited for endoscopy. The Care Quality Commission has rated 92% of our hospitals as good and 95% of our patients would recommend us to their friends and family. We're a leader in day case surgery. We've looked at the way that our hospitals are designed so that we can treat ever more patients in today's healthcare. The future of healthcare is all about partnerships and integrating the patient journey. At Ramsey, this means we need to be working very closely with all our partners, including the NHS, to make sure that our services are available in all the communities that our hospitals serve. Over time, I can see the company both growing and expanding in the reach of its services. But for me, most of all, patient safety and quality come first. Simply put, people caring for people. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's BOFAS Lectures of Distinction on sports injuries around the ankle. My name is Yasagani, and I'll be your moderator tonight. Um, thank you to Ramsey Healthcare for sponsoring the lecture series. And tonight's speaker is Fraser Harold, and I'll introduce him in a minute. Just uh, some housekeeping. Lecture of Dis Distinctions continues to gain popularity, and your feedback is actually crucial. So please keep that coming. Uh, and that's the way we use your feedback to improve the series. Uh, please submit your questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen and not through the chat. Uh, you'll receive automatically uh, the link for feedback and you can get your attendance certificates for CPD following the submission of your feedback. If you don't receive the link, you can use a previous link and we'll put it in the chat, the feedback code as well. Now, tonight's speaker is Fraser Harold, who's a consultant uh, foot and ankle surgeon from Dundee, and he has a keen interest in education and training. And he has also been previously voted BOTA Trainer of the Year. So, and he's worked really hard on this uh, tonight's topic. Uh, so without further delay, over to Mr. Harold. Uh, yes, good evening. Uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, speak this evening. Uh, I'm going to run this as a um, FRCS style Viva uh, session. Uh, so I'll go straight on to share my screen. Um, and get moving. I've got two colleagues here who are Perry Exam, uh, Mr. Peter Hutchinson and Ms. Rebecca Lewis, who I'm going to Viva on some cases associated with sports related, related injuries. So if we'll start with Mr. Mr. Hutchison, um, the first case I'm going to speak on is uh, a 34 year old uh, active female. She's played uh, high level competitive hockey and she sustained an inversion injury um, uh, at the time of playing hockey six months ago. She was treated initially with physiotherapy 
But at this stage, she presents to your clinic still complaining of pain and giving way uh, with some associated swelling at six months post injury. Uh, just to talk to me through how you would uh, manage this patient. Fine, yes. So uh, I would start with the general principles of uh, history, examination, investigation, starting with the history. Uh, I'd be asking her generic parts. So, what's her background, her employment, her hobbies, particularly with regards to this hockey? Is is she a, a weekend warrior that prefers going for a drink after? Is she national? Is she subnational level? How important is it to her? Uh, I'd want to get a background of her as well. So, is she a smoker and take a past medical history? With regards to the injury itself, I'd be looking at a detailed history of, of what happened and when, so how long ago, and a good history of the examination and the history of, did she hear a, a, a pop or a crack? Was there any swelling or ecchymosis at the time? Um, and, and where was it? Uh, also, with regards to the injury at the time, did she did she do anything about it? Did she, did she attend hospital, go to the emergency department? And if so, who did she see? Um, and was she seen by a surgeon? Did she have any operations uh, or did she go down or did she see a physiotherapist, for example? Uh, and if she did see a physiotherapist, I'd want to know oh, know who and, and what was the physiotherapy. Uh, and more to that, I'd want to sort of see if she could look me in the eye and tell me honestly that she actually participated in the physiotherapy if she went down that route. Um, other things I'd want to know is what have her symptoms been since? So how often is she getting these episodes of, of pain and instability? Uh, and does it come in that order? Is it pain then instability, suggesting a, a pseudo instability? Or is it that she's lost faith in this ankle that it's, it's just giving way on her when she when she tries to come off of it? And, and also want to know a, a bit about her expectations. So sort of the usual physiotherapy question, what's, what's she looking to get out, uh, what she wants her ankle to be like and what she wanting from the interventions? It's pretty solid history. Um, just to fill in some of the background for you then. So uh, she's high level, she's national standard hockey player. Um, she had a severe uh, inversion injury with uh, obvious ecchymosis uh, and significant swelling immediately after the, uh, the event. She didn't continue playing and was taken off and treated by the, uh, the physiotherapist for the club. Um, she's had, she's has had appropriate physiotherapy um, over the last six months, but she now continues with uh, instability without any prodromal symptoms. So it's just uh, immediately gives away underneath her uh, and uh, she can't rely on it. She's otherwise fit and well. It doesn't appear to affect her ADLs at all. And she continues to work, but is keen to get back to uh, playing hockey again. Okay, good. So I'd move on to examination after that. Um, once again, split it into ge generic parts and focus parts. So generic foot and ankle examination, expose her up to the knees. Uh, I'd want to see her walking. Uh, I'd want to assess the attitude of her feet and ankle from, from all sides. Uh, we know that increased risk of, of lateral injuries from cave of various feet. So a cursory glance at the hands as well. Uh, moving on to uh, feel, I'd want to uh, palpate the bony promises and common things being common. I want to uh, palpate the base of the fifth metatarsal. Um, and I would want to palpate joint lines and the collateral ligamentous complexes as well. I mean, really, if she, uh, assume from the history, she would have told me it'd be the, the lateral side. I think you did say that, but it could very rarely be the medial side. Um, I'd also want to then go on to a uh, sort of focused uh, assessment of. If she, if she is saying sort of lateral uh, ligamentous pain, I'd be looking at uh, specific examinations. So if we're, th if we're thinking from that point of view, I'd want to do an anterior drawer test uh, and a inversion uh, stress test. Could do these both clinically or, or and under radio radiological assessment uh, in clinic. Um, but that would be more down the investigation route. If we're thinking of other uh, soft tissue pathology, we could assess the perineal tendons or high ankle strain, uh, sprain, sorry. So that would be cotton test or, or do it strapping, see how she does with the high ankle strapping as well. Good. Um, it, all, it, it appears to be lateral uh, ankle, uh, a lateral ligament rather, uh, so the ATFL uh, around that area. Um, and it doesn't appear to be tender anywhere else. Your draw test was positive uh, and uh, your inversion test was uh, negative. Uh, so that made me suspicious that uh, it was her 
anterior talofibular ligament had gone and uh, therefore I would want to move on to imaging. Oh, not arrived yet. Oh, here it is. Good, yeah, so well, f first thing I would say is I'd, I'd want weight-bearing views. Um, can't comment on these, but they're not saying it. And uh, otherwise, nothing nothing obvious that I can see there. Okay, that's fine. I would agree with you. Uh, weight-bearing is really important. Um, any other further imaging you'd want to get and any particular reason for doing the modality? <sighs> So the for these types of so if I'm thinking it's a lateral ligamentous complex, I'd be first line would be an MRI after my radiographs. Um, that would be partly to assess the ligaments themselves, uh, but also to look for things that might be causing pain. So is there any osseous uh, lesion or osteochondral D? Yeah. So um, so MRI. So on the left we have uh, an axial and a coronal uh, T. T1, which shows an intact anterior talofibular ligament and an osteochondral defect uh, and the talus. And then on the right, we have got a T1 and a, uh, I think it's a, a stir image showing an uh, anterior talofibular ligament uh, rupture or tear. Okay, so uh, with that, that information from the history examination, uh, as well as the imaging, uh, how do you want to take this forward? So after done that, we'd have to have a detailed chat with the patient. Um, and as we said, she's a national uh, player. So she's already she's already persisted with the physiotherapy side of things. She's gone down a management route. So we'd be counseling her on to operative intervention. Um, at this stage, uh, we'd be uh, talking. So that's when we'd have a talk about repair versus reconstruction, anatomical versus non-anatomical. But in our institution, the, the option would be a, a modified rostrum repair is what, what we'd offer. Okay, good. Uh, can you just talk through um, the surgical procedure for me, just in, uh, in brief? Um, so for that, we'd want uh, an appropriately uh, anaesthetized, marked, consented, and positioned patient. So supine with a bump under the buttock and possibly a tourniquet. And then uh, we'd uh, uh, prep the patient drape and mark the osseous structures and oblique incision distal to the fibula, just distal, uh, and leaving a sharp dissection through the extensor retinac or just above the extensor retinaculum uh, with some soft tissue to repair there and not going straight onto the bone with the fibula, leaving a cuff there as well. But underneath that, uh, preparing the osseous surfaces for any, for, uh, just for the healing purposes. So take a rongeurs or a nibble to the edge of the, edge of the fibula. Um, and then uh, using uh, osseous anchors, usually two, one for the CFL, one for the a uh, ATFL, um, and then if, so long as the tendon, so long as the ligaments are, in, are strong and intact, uh, doing an anatomical repair there, and then the gold modification, so that would be reefing in the uh, extensor retinaculum in a sort of pants over vest uh, method. Good, very good. Okay, I, I, that's a, a pretty good uh, answer to the to the question. I'm just going to go over that now uh, in a bit more detail. So uh, Pete was pretty thorough with his uh, history. Uh, it's really important uh, to get an understanding of the time period um, to get a, uh, element, you know, to understand the chronicity of this, uh, and also the mechanism of injury is really important. Um, it does tell you an awful lot, a lot of information, and this was a classic inversion injury at her ankle. She is a professional athlete rather than social, so that uh, is relevant. In terms of symptoms, uh, she had pain uh, as well as instability, but she didn't have any prodromal symptoms. Um, suggesting that this may have been a, a, an OCD um, at the time. Um, oh, it's always important to ask about recurrent sprains, feeling of apprehension. We're looking to find out whether this is pseudo um, instability or whether this is functional or whether it's mechanical. Uh, was there any associated swelling with this or did it settle down? Uh, Pete mentioned about cracking and popping. These are relevant uh, questions to ask at the time of injury because it may be indicative of particular pathology. Uh, you always want to know whether these are single events or multiple events over years. 
and how frequently she's experiencing her symptoms. What impact is it having on her, on her job, on her activities of daily living, and in her case, on her sport? Um, interventions, you, it is important to, to identify whether she's had appropriate physiotherapy, and um, Ms. Hutchison had uh, picked up on that, um, as it is important, you need to know that they've had appropriate uh, rehabilitation. Um, have they had any intervention from orthotics or footwear? Have they had previous surgery to the same site? One area that was missed was uh, just asking about hypermobility, um, and that is an important question and relevant question. When we look at the examination, it's it's very straightforward, isn't it? It's classic look, feel, move. If I'm honest, I sometimes shuffle, feel, and move around to um, uh, allow the movement first before I start palpating, as often they're quite sore after you've done the palpation. Uh, ensure they're adequately exposed. Looking at this stage, six months down the line, you're unlikely to see ecchymosis, but you will see uh, occasional swelling if it's a recent inversion. Um, Look for a subtle cable varus or flat foot deformity uh, that may either contribute to or, um, or protect against uh, inver these inversion injuries. Ask the patient to walk and finally just check their baiting score. Uh, when you're looking at movements, you're looking at ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, and also looking at inversion and eversion. And test the muscle strength, the muscle groups around the, uh, the ankle, and then finally check their proprioception. We're looking for areas of tenderness, as Mr. Hutchinson mentioned, palpate uh, the, the important areas in the acute setting. You're looking at the Ottawa uh, ankle rules, and one of those includes the fifth metatarsal. Examine the subtalar joint, uh, as that may be contributing to the uh, hind foot instability. Also examine the perineals and triceps uriae. Mr. Hutchinson mentioned about the um, palpating the AITFL. That's important in syndesmotic injuries, as the mechanism is very similar in terms of injury. And then Malloy's impingement tests are also uh, relevant as these can, these can uh, provide prodromal symptoms for what we call pseudo instability. And then finally, the stress tests that he mentioned are the anterior draw and inversion. X-rays are important uh, and just to reiterate, weight bearing X-rays ideally. Um, stress views, if you can get them in the clinic, they're very useful. I tend to do them uh, preoperatively once I'm sure uh, I've um, got the right diagnosis. I routinely do uh, arrange an MRI scan and I'm looking for those OCDs that are not seen on um, plain film and uh, up to 30% of them are missed on x-rays. Um, and I'm also looking for any, uh, anything that suggests to me that there may be pseudo instability from other uh, pathology within the foot and ankle. Uh, just keep in mind, though, uh, it's relatively low sensitivity and specificity for ligament injury uh, when it's compared to ultrasound, and that because of the obliquity of the view relative to the axial views of the, um, of the MRI scan. In terms of uh, surgical management, uh, uh, as has already been mentioned, we look at anatomical reconstruction for ruptured ligaments, uh, and this is a, a simple process of imbrication um, of the ligament reattaching uh, a fragment to the bone, uh, a pants of a vest style um, suture, uh, suture to, the, um, to each other. Um, the data is pretty good on these. Uh, most of the studies are retrospective comparative studies, but they do suggest that the anatomical reconstructions provide superior results in the long term. And you can uh, consent the patient for a, a, an excellent result in around 80% of cases. Uh, Non-anatomic, uh, uh, reconstructions are generally reserved for revision surgery, but uh, I think the general consensus is, and, and my own practice reflects this, that if it does recur again, I tend to revise the rostrum uh, and will obviously put the gold modification in as well. So some key points here, detailed documented history and examination, as well as appropriate investigations are critical. You need to confirm whether there's a mechanical or functional instability or potentially pseudo instability associated with uh, another localized pathology. It's critical that they have appropriate physiotherapy, and if you have any doubt at all, I would advise on referring them to a good physiotherapist who will put them through their paces. If it's purely pain they're experiencing, and i.e. pseudo instability, then in 75% of cases, arthroscopy alone uh, can be effective in um, managing those symptoms, um, and not that they don't require a, a brostrum or a reconstruction. However, 
Uh, if you've got obvious mechanical instability, then you proceed with the reconstruction. I would normally do an EUA first uh, with a documented, uh, uh, documented on x-ray uh, and then proceed to an arthroscopy. And I think there's always value in uh, undertaking arthroscopy prior to the brostrum to look for any evidence of arthrofibrosis or any uh, lesions that are not always picked up on MR uh, or in the clinical uh, history that uh, will improve the outcome. Brostrum remains the gold standard. You should have an awareness of uh, both anatomic and non-anatomic reconstruction. And I would expect you to have a, a, a decent understanding of the surgical technique. Here are a couple of key papers uh, I think are worth looking at. Uh, Jay Hurtle's paper, looking at uh, some of the basic science of it. And then there's a very good uh, consensus on chronic ankle stability, uh, which provides uh, a lot of the, the uh, literature uh, in a summarized form. Okay, we're going to move on now to uh, Miss Lewis. Um, I'm going to give her a very similar, in fact, same scenario. And I'm just going to ask uh, if she can approach the, the same problem. So a 34-year-old uh, national standard hockey player, uh, what's your approach to, to the management of this patient in your clinic? Um, so it would be much the same as uh, Pete. So in the first instance, I'd want to take a detailed mm -hmm. history. Um, so I'd want to know... Um, more about the mechanism of injury, whether she knows what position her foot was in at the time of the injury and, and what the forces at play were, whether it's been an inversion or twisting injury, um, whether there was any kind of uh, sensation of a snap or whether she sustained a, a fracture at the same time, you know, at the time of the injury, uh, what treatment she had initially and um, whether she attended uh, A&E for an x-ray or whether she just managed it with uh, RICE protocol at home. Want to know um, how frequently the episodes are occurring, um, and I'd want to know, um, as Pete alluded to in the last case, whether she's getting pain and then an episode of instability, or whether she's it's unstable and then becomes painful. Um, I'd want to know whether there was any initial swelling and the location of that. Um, and um, I'd want to take a bit more of a, a detailed social history. So I want to know about um, the, what level she plays hockey at, what her expectations are of, of her, um, what outcome she wants from the treatment of, of her ankle, whether she has an expectation that she'll get back to uh, playing hockey or whether she's hung up her, her boots following this injury. Um, I'd want to know more about her past medical history um, and uh, any current medications. And I'd want to know if there's any history of hyperlaxity within that. So anything like Ela Danlos or um, other connective tissue diseases that might, uh, might predispose her to uh, problems with joint laxity, um, whether she has any history of recurrent shoulder dislocations, et cetera, elsewhere in the body. Um, what else do I want to know? probably probably enough her occupation is whether this is having an effect on her ADLs and her her occupational status okay good uh, so I'll um the, the background is very similar she's um so a national standard hockey player fit and well no past medical history of note uh, she describes at the time of a crack or sort of a popping sound when she uh, inverted her ankle um she was initially assessed by the physiotherapist and taken off the pitch. Um, she did get a plain film done at the time of injury uh, in the emergency department um, based on the uh, Otto ankle rules, um, but they didn't identify anything. Uh, and she had a formal uh, rehab with physiotherapy, but has continued to experience what she describes as clicking and, and subsequent giving way of her ankle. Uh, at six months down the line, she's been able to manage her day-to-day -day, uh, life uh, and her job, but she's been unable to return to her sport because of ongoing pain. Okay. Um, right. um, so, you, uh, so she's got ongoing uh, instability and then pain by the sounds of things. Um, so my uh, differential diagnosis here would include an osteochondral lesion, uh, which is flicking in and out of the joint, causing instability. Um, or potentially um, perineal tendon subluxation. Um, so she's already had an extra, which didn't show a fracture. So um, this was high ankle sprain potentially, uh, again, as and again, lateral ankle instability is a potential diagnosis, although with the history of a, a crack, that seems less, less likely. Okay, so just talk me through your examination again. 
Um, so examine each inside, want to get her to want to get her to walk, see what her gait, her normal gait cycles like, um, looking for the normal uh, kind of uh, positioning of her feet, whether she's got a tendency towards cavus or varus feet. Um, looking for any obvious swellings, although we're six months down the line, so wouldn't necessarily expect to see swelling or ecchymosis at this time. Um, she may be able to reproduce the symptoms that she's getting, so reproduce her instability. Um, so if she's able to do that, I'd get her to do that. Um, and then I'd be wanting um, to get uh, to assess the range of movement. So I'd firstly be assessing her active range of movement and then move on to a passive range of movement of the ankle joint, uh, midfoot, hind foot. Um, move, then uh, from, from there, I'd want, be wanting to move on to assess the power. Um, so ankle dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion and eversion. Um, and I'd be wanting to then uh, palpate around the bony prominences of the, the ankle and um, so over both malleoli uh, along the ankle joints, again, up the syndesmosis, looking for any evidence of a high ankle sprain and uh, uh, around the lateral uh, ligament complex around the lateral malleolus and up behind the, the malleolus into the region of the perineal tendons. Okay. Um, and then I do a full neurovascular examination as well as part of that. Uh, that's fine. So on, on your, exam your examination findings, uh, she's got a swelling uh, and tenderness localized around the perineals. Mm -hmm. uh, and you are able to elicit um, a popping or a, a subluxation of the uh, tendon. Uh, what test would you use to, to do that? Um, so you can get the patient to, uh, you can basically get them to dorsiflex and evert their ankle and you resist that and that reproduces the, the symptoms okay. or it's weak. So uh, th those are your main findings. Uh, how do you want to take it from here? Um, so it sounds it sounds like she's got potentially a perineal tendon pathology. Um, I think in the in the first instance, I'd still want to get an X-ray um, to a rule out any obvious uh, previous fracture which wasn't picked up, but um, to look for any uh, signs on X-ray of perineal tendon disruption or subluxation. Okay, so you've got your plane from this was the one from the ED department at the time. Anything particular that you note on it? Um, so they've got an AP and lateral of a right, uh, well, one's a right ankle, one's a left ankle. Again, non-weight bearing films. Um, the left, the AP image, unfortunately, is not projecting that well, but there's a hint of some, uh, a, a flake over the lateral side of the lateral malleolus, um, which may represent a flex sign. Um, so that would be a pathognomic of a grade three, uh, perineal tendon subluxation. Um, you mentioned you mentioned grading, so that tells me about classification. Which classification are you referring to? Um, so that's the Eckert and Davis classification, um, which with a modification by Odin. So it's grades one to four. Um, so uh, one, you have the superior perineal retinaculums just been uh, stripped from the back of the lateral malleolus, um, but the fibrocartilaginous ridge remains intact. Two, both of them have been stripped from the back of the lateral malleolus. Three, there's been an evulsion of bone along with the SPR and the fibrocartilaginous ridge. And then four is the Odin modification. Um, so you've got um, complete evulsional rupture of the SPR. Um, at its posterior insertion, and then you can get a kind of stena, to, uh, stena lesion uh, where the perineals lie superficial to that, to the bit of SPR that's become avulsed. Okay, good. Uh, how do you want to manage this? Uh, it is a grade three. Um, um, so I still, uh, down the line, national hockey player. Um, so, um, so she's already failed a trial of conservative management, although with the Montgomery ruling, you'd still need to discuss further con conservative options with her, which again would be physiotherapy and potentially a period of immobilization. Um, but the, about 50% of them will fail conservative management. She already sort of falls into that category. So you'd be moving towards a surgical uh, repair of the of of that avulsed fragment in this uh, superior perineal retinaculum, but um, you'd also increase the size of the groove, uh, but the retrofibular groove to so deepen that um, to try and reduce the chance of it uh, resubluxing. Good, well done. Excellent. Okay, thanks very much, Ms. Lewis. Thanks.
So one of the other things that um, we didn't mention, uh, I'll just, I'll come back to that shortly, but I'll just go through the history. I'm not gonna repeat this again, but it's quite obvious um, that the history is critical and it's obviously identical for the, la for the last two cases that we've discussed. I'm not gonna go through this in detail again, uh, but it's there for you to look at. Uh, examination is exactly the same. We are looking for all the detail for the postural lateral uh, hind foot. Um, I've also put in there the Ottawa rules. That really applies in the acute setting. You assume at six months that these wouldn't be applicable. Um, but uh, I, I think if you see a patient in the acute setting, you, you're obliged to uh, undertake the Ottawa uh, ankle rules. So in this case, uh, the specifics of the examination was really around the perineals. Uh, and uh, as Lewis had mentioned, it's this resisted eversion and dorsiflexion that precipitate, precipitates the sublux, um, subluxation of perineus longus. And in this case, you can see it uh, in the image on the uh, right. So um, weight-bearing films, plain rectories are useful. Um, they were, if you were doing it acutely, she would have um, had postural lateral uh, fibular pain and therefore you'd have been obliged to arrange a, a, a plain film. And in this case, you can see this more obviously in this image, the flex sign, which suggests this is a grade three um, uh, retinacular injury. Uh, this resulted in the chronic subluxation of her perineal tendons. Um, it's dealer's choice, really. You have the option of either a dynamic ultrasound or a MRI scan in, in my practice, we have a very good uh, group of radiologists who are happy to undertake ultrasound. It's cheap, easy, and easy, easy and readily available from our perspective compared to MRI. Uh, and in this case, you can see the obviously subluxed uh, perineus longus tendon uh, with an interruption to the retinaculum. So let's look a little bit about the uh, look at the function and epidemiology of this uh, condition. So. As Ms. Lewis has already mentioned in, in the examination, which was identifying the pathology, uh, it is a foot everter and pronator, um, and is the primary uh, everter and pronator of the feet. Uh, it, uh, the perineals comprise the lateral compartment of the uh, leg, uh, and the tendons uh, uh, come off relatively close to the fibula with the perineus brevis. Uh, occasionally, the muscle belly will extend down into the uh, retinacular region and, and can be the cause of some pathology. Uh, with regard to perineus longus, it's a secondary uh, foot plantar flexor uh, as it uh, uh, moves around from the cuboid across, inserting into the base of the first metatarsal and uh, medial cuneiform. Both these tendons are important as dynamic stabilizers of the ankle joint. Uh, and of course, this is why it's part of this uh, pathology that we're looking at, at ankle instability and uh, perineal pathology. With regard to pathology, it represents only 0.3 to 0.5 percent of ankle injuries. But if you think there may be 20 odd thousand in the USA, 20 odd thousand ankle injuries, um, you suddenly appreciate that actually there's a fair bit of um, there's a fair chance that there will be some perineal pathology associated with these injuries. Um, I'm just going to move my screen across. Uh, it's commonly associated with uh, sports, particularly rapidly changing uh, sports associated with rapidly changing direction and deceleration, such as rugby, football, uh, hockey, um, and tennis and squash. Um, they, there is a, an association with anatomical variants. Um, this can include the perineal groove. Um, in around 80% of the uh, occasions, the perineal groove is concave, but there are a small proportion that are both um, uh, that are either convex or uh, just flat. Uh, and there has been some suggestion that these do contribute to uh, associated perineal pathology. So how does it happen? Uh, as this is identified, it's forced ankle dorsiflexion and eversion. Uh, eversion, uh, all associated with resisted. So it's really when you're turning on your ankle. It can, uh, obviously, uh, there can be some associated uh, uh, pathology such as a, a subtle paper varus foot that can contribute to the symptoms too, and this increases the risk of injury to the lateral structures. Uh, broadly, we're looking at uh, pathology in the perineals include tendinopathy, tears, ruptures, and uh, perineal tendon subluxation. So, uh, Ms. Lewis had mentioned about the grading system by Eckhart and Davis. Uh, that's uh, described in, in the four boxes on the left. 
from grades one to four. Uh, Odin added the fourth classification of this kind of stenar style uh, lesion. Um, and I'll leave you at leisure to look at the, the other three. Uh, the top diagram reflects the normal, uh, normal anatomy in which perineus brevis is one, perineus longus is two. We've got the retinaculum in R and F is the um, fibrocatalogenous um, lip that basically increases the depth of the, um, of the groove. Uh, it's equivalent to something like the labrum on a glenoid. Uh, just for completeness, I've included uh, Raikin's uh, classification of uh, perineal pathology, which includes the slippage of uh, perineus longus, uh, or the exchange really of the position of perineus longus and perineus brevis, where longus is adjacent to the, um, to the groove and perineus brevis slips um, to the posterior aspect of it. This can occasionally be associated with a split in the, in the uh, brevis tendon that results in longus passing between the, the two slips. Um, there is some, uh, some folk in the literature that suggests this actually is really a great a, a, a alternative version of a grade one injury. So clinical decision-making, um, as Ms. Lewis has done well, uh, this is really about, involves a detailed documented history and examination with appropriate investigations. You're looking for a diagnosis of perineal pathology, uh, and in some of these are tendinopathy, tears, ruptures, and in this case, a grade three perineal subluxation. Uh, I put just for completeness, you can also get osperineum syndrome and also hypertrophy, the, uh, hypertrophy of, the tibial, of the perineal tubercle uh, as um, other causes of potential pathology. The important questions to ask are, are these acute or chronic injuries? Um, as it, uh, it does impact on decision-making, is this a high-level athlete or a non-athlete? So um, conservative management. In the initial setting, if you're dealing with a, uh, with a, a low demand individual uh, in the acute setting, it would be reasonable to offer the option of conservative management with around about a, uh, between 38 and 57% is quoted in the literature, so around 50% success rate. Um, uh, but this would not be regarded as uh, satisfactory for anybody who's doing any high level sport. In brief, the, the management for these are two weeks in cast non weight bearing, we then convert to a boot, which you can weight bear in uh, with active range of movement, and then commence on the strength and proprioception work. And it can take up to between, around about three months to fully, fully recover from. For those who are high demand and where they are chronic uh, uh, injuries, uh, and I use the term chronic uh, carefully because there's really no classification for this, uh, for chronicity. Um, uh, we've looked at it from two weeks up to six months. Uh, and I think most would agree at around the six month mark, if you've exhausted conservative measures, that would be regarded as a chronic injury. Broadly, if you're talking about operative intervention, you can describe them into uh, three categories, that of rerouting procedures, soft tissue reconstruction, and bony procedures. There are a variety of procedures described with good to excellent results, but all the um, published work is, uh, is essentially small case series. So uh, just for completeness, the rerouting procedure, one of them, for example, is um, rerouting it underneath the CFL uh, ligament, which can be uh, detached with a, a, a bony um, uh, lump. It can be removed and then reattached. And I don't, I've not done this myself, but it is described in literature. Uh, you've got the option of soft tissue reconstruction, which is by far the commonest procedure. And this is the reconstruction of the perineal retinaculum as a direct repair. And it can be done either open or endoscopically. Um, there are some descriptions of using uh, autograft to augment the um, superior perineal retinaculum. Um, and again, this is really just for completeness. With regard to the bony procedures, uh, a bone block has been described uh, using a part of the fibula to increase the depth of the um, fibula groove. But the commonest description now is that of fibula groove deepening, which can either be done with a burr or with a small osteotome. Uh, and it can be done either open or endoscopically. The general consensus that is for those who are relatively low demand, uh, a simple um, uh, super, superficial perineal uh, retinacular repair 
And for those who are high level athletes, it should also go in combination with groove deepening. Uh, it's important to know, obviously, particularly when you're dealing with chronic injuries, that you may well have to manage uh, some of the uh, associated uh, pathology that's present. And this can often include uh, chronic tendon tears or tendinopathy. Uh, you may also identify that the patient may have a low-lying um, muscle belly from peroneus brevis uh, that would require partial resection um, or an accessory muscle such as tertius or quartius. Um, and then if, the, if there is uh, pain with uh, the presence of hypertrophic tubercle, I would consider uh, paring that down. I'm going to touch briefly on uh, perineal tears just for completeness. Um, there are, these exist in around 11 to 38% uh, in the general population, of which the majority of these are asymptomatic, but we're not absolutely certain as this, this work was based on a, a, a cadaveric series. Um, the consensus is if, if they're symptomatic, then you can offer debridement and tubularization. Uh, if the tear is less than 50%, uh, this is effective. Uh, in this number is rather an arbitrary number uh, and it's, it's based on no science at all. And I would tend to use the rule if I can, if I can pull the tendon and, and it allows it to move and it doesn't uh, completely rupture, then I'll consider um, debridement and tubularization. If it is not repairable, i.e. it is ruptured, uh, then you can consider autograft from um, uh, ha hamstring. Um, or consider a tenodesis uh, with uh, perineus longus to perineus brevis. Uh, the consensus generally is that uh, the reverse is not as effective as it will impact on the biomechanics of the foot. I've got some key papers here um, just to, to uh, highlight uh, so, some of the problems. So the, I think it's well worth seeing looking at the consensus statement on perineal tendon pathologies uh, led by Van Dyke. Um, and the two papers below are uh, good review articles, uh, particularly on uh, perineal uh, subluxation. Um, I'll just check with the uh, moderator. I've got one more uh, question, but I, I suspect we're going to run out of time. It's an identical pathology. But this is looking at uh, high ankle sprains. I'm not going to torture uh, my uh, colleagues anymore uh, with exam, uh, exam questions. Uh, yes, are you happy for us to continue with this uh, talk? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we have time. Good. Um, so exactly the same history is described. Uh, I think the it's interesting that the uh, perineal pathology and the high ankle sprain both have exactly the same mechanism of injury. Uh, and therefore, you should have a high index of suspicion for uh, picking this up. Uh, and in this case, you can see on the plane radiograph on the right, uh, that there's an element of um, uh, Taylor shift. Uh, and there is certainly an increased uh, uh, space between the uh, fibula and tibia at the incisura. Uh, an MRI scan uh, is very useful for identifying this pathology. Um, and in this case, you can see the AIT fellows disrupted uh, and you've got this um, uh, ring of fire sign, uh, which is basically um, fluid escaping uh, up through the ruptured um, ligamentous structure. So I'll briefly look at ankle sprains, uh, just for completeness, as I said, the, the examination, so the history, the examination, and the investigations are pretty much identical to the other pathologies. With this pathology, again, it links in with ankle sprains, as does the perineal uh, pathology. It can occur in up to 16% of ankle sprains in athletes, maybe even higher. Um, it's generally associated with the AITFL and rarely the uh, posterior structures. Um, as you're aware from uh, your um, trauma experience, uh, up to 30% of vapor B fractures will have some element of um, disruption to the um, syndesmosis. And in those that are uh, a vapor Cs or high ankle fractures, it's, it's as high as 70%. Um, it's important though that you identify that it, is, it may well have a concomitant uh, deltoid ligament injury, and that's important in the uh, decision-making. So why is it important? Well, we know that it is any small translation uh, or Taylor shift will result in large uh, contact stresses at the ankle joint. And you can be fairly sure that if you see these patients a few years down the line, they will have osteoarthritic changes uh, and often they'll be symptomatic. Uh, we do know that instability and malreduction are important independent predictors of long-term functional outcome uh, with uh, discontinuity at the tibio-taylor joint. 
patients. So how do we assess these patients exactly the same as before? Uh, we identify from the history that they get pain at rest, um, pain with palpation, particularly over the AITFL. Um, Cotton's test uh, is uh, another test that's described. We've got fibular translation, squeeze test, external rotation stress test, and dorsiflexion stress testing, uh, muscle minus strapping. The last one is one that I tend to do. I'll ask the patient to stand up onto their toes uh, and uh, it is painful. I will then strap the ankle. Uh, I um, uh, tighten up the syndesmosis and ask them to repeat the process. And if that improves the symptoms, it would suggest to me that they have uh, some disruption to the uh, syndesmosis. However, when you look at the clinical diagnosis, the, um, the accuracy of this, uh, you can see the kappa nut values for these are all relatively low. And in fact, really the, the highest one is actually for palpation. So that's gonna be one of your key diagnostic tools is, is actually looking at um, uh, direct palpation. So plain x-rays, are they useful? Well, they are when you get the, the one I've just shown you, which, is, uh, which gives you a frank diastasis. It's fairly obvious there uh, in that one with, uh, with Taylor shift. It's important you get a weight-bearing view, both AP and lateral, as well as a mortise view. Stress views are helpful, but always often difficult in our clinic to, to get them. Um, I think they tend to be unreliable in, in particularly occult injuries. Uh, and certainly some studies suggest that it's uh, only 43% sensitivity, but if, they, if, they, if you do get um, uh, diastasis, it's 100% specific. Um, it will obviously matter in terms of uh, position of the foot. CT is another useful adjunct, um, but um, it's never proven to be 100% uh, effective. Obviously, the thing we don't have is weight-bearing CT in the majority of NHS practice, uh, but it's something that may come out to be proved to be a useful tool. It doesn't identify any of the soft tissue uh, pathology either. So then we come to MRI scan. And um, these are uh, tend to be 100% uh, sensitive, 93 to 100% specific, and fairly accurate uh, for identifying the pathology. Uh, Jim Calder uh, published a paper in 2017 looking at this broken ring of fire, uh, which, uh, although has a sensitivity of only uh, just under 50%, if it is identified, is um, if it does occur, then it's specific one for 100% for uh, a syndesmotic injury. Uh, and I think it's a useful adjunct in, in the acute setting, but obviously if you see these patients chronically, you're unlikely to get this um, uh, on the MRI scan. So arthroscopy, well, that's uh, also a, a validated um, a tool to identify uh, the uh, syndesmotic injury. You can see it directly as you, as you can see in the current image. Um, and normally you should be able to get a three millimeter scope in the syndesmotic recess. Um, well, sorry, you can't get into the recess, but in those that are unstable, you get what we call a drive-through test, where you can push the scope up into the gutter uh, and it will, uh, it will take it comfortably. And in these cases, it is likely to be uh, stable, uh, sorry, unstable. So how do we classify these? Well, actually there are a lot of different classifications. This is one example, which is the best point, the one that most of us will know about. Uh, the grade ones are mild sprains or tear to the ARTFL with no instability of the ankle um, and no obvious diastasis. The grade threes are complete injuries uh, with disruption to all the ligaments, including the, uh, the deltoid, and this results in instability and diastasis. And then you've got this area, the grade two injuries, which are more difficult to discern. And these are injuries to the ARTFL um, with a partial tear to the interosseous ligament and slight instability, but no obvious diastasis. And this is the group that's the most challenging group to manage. For the grade ones, they're fairly straightforward. They're managed conservatively. And for those that are grade three, uh, it's again, straightforward is operative intervention. So again, uh, Calder uh, has put this classification together uh, nicely with um, encompassing uh, arthroscopy to identify the, um, the pathology. And in his case, in a grade two A injury, you have a stable structure with normal deltoid ligament, negative squeeze test, uh, and only an, a possible AITFL injury. These can be managed conservatively as the talus is stable. But for those that are grade two B, which I uh, here 
defines as dynamically unstable, there is an obvious deltoid injury, positive squeeze test, but the PITFL may be intact. Uh, and these cases, he consider arthroscopic assessment. If it's unstable, he would proceed on to um, stabilization. As I've just mentioned, that's uh, what we're doing. With regard to the management surgically, um, it's dealer's choice. Debridement and reconstruction are the primary choices. Um, there are lots of others described in literature, frames, biosorbable screws, suture loops, end of button, screw fixation, tight ropes. Uh, there are many of them. Uh, but there's no consensus on it. So in summary, you can see that there are three different pathologies here with a very similar history and presentation. Uh, and this means that the history and examination are really important uh, with appropriate investigations. Also be aware that you can get coexistent pathologies, um, such as perineal pathology associated with the uh, lateral uh, ATFL ligament injury. And uh, also you can get high ankle uh, sprains associated with the uh, ankle inversion injuries as well as perineal pathology. Uh, management is based on the clinical findings and the investigations, and obviously it's in the context of patient-related factors. Thank you. That's great, Mr. Harold. Um, fantastic talk. We'll take, um, we've got a few minutes for a couple of questions, so we take that. Um, one is coming uh, from Hamid Mazucci. Is there any role of acute repair in cases such as your ankle sprains with an ATFL rupture? Um, yep, so uh, there is actually a level one study, um, a randomized trial done on this that actually showed uh, that the outcomes were better in, in terms of return to, to uh, sporting activity. Um, however, the the authors of the paper suggested that actually uh, in the context of potential risk uh, in terms of complications from your surgery, uh, they felt that it would still be pertinent to consider conservative measures first before proceeding down the route of uh, surgical fixation. This obviously has to be balanced in the context of what um, the individual uh, is doing. If they're, if they're a professional sportsman, uh, then there may be merit in accepting the risk to allow them to return to their work uh, earlier. Okay, so following question from that is, do, does it matter at what time period a patient presents to you, or would you still continue? So if they presented, you know, six months down the line, would you still give them conservative management initially and then consider the operative management? So certainly for ankle instability, uh, one of the important questions, Mr. Hutchinson actually touched on it well, is because he knows I know this. I asked a very detailed question about exactly what they did with physiotherapy. Uh, and whether they were compliant with their physiotherapy. Because we do know that if, if they are compliant with their physio, uh, they, they've got every chance, but 80% chance that they will be happy with their outcome and they will not require surgical intervention. So I try to push them down the conservative route if they have not exhausted that thoroughly. Okay, thank you. Um, and another, I think, last question. So you mentioned briefly about asking them in a history or examining them for um, hypermobility. And I know in the FRCS cases, you will get patients who have hypermobility. So you check your patents. Does that alter your management? Yes, it does. I, we, it's, it's more likely, for example, let's say ankle instability, uh, it's, it's more likely that your prostrum will fail uh, with uh, those patients who have an underlying collagen disorder. Um, uh, and in, in those patients, uh, I generally advise against um, surgical intervention, uh, but there are the options, and we've discussed this before, in fact, last year we discussed this, the option of using um, artificial grafts such as taping to uh, augment or support the, uh, the reconstruction. We don't have long-term data on that, um, but it's certainly something uh, that can be considered uh, in this patient group. That's great. I think uh, that's all we have time for uh, tonight. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Hal, for a brilliant session on uh, these topics and the vivas and case-based discussions. Uh, obviously, you've put in a lot of effort into this. And also thank you to Rebecca and Peter for stepping up and being under the spotlight. Um, so uh, brilliant stuff. Um,
Thank you to uh, Ramsey Healthcare for uh, continuing to be our sponsor. A reminder that the attendance certificates uh, for CPD will be issued after you've submitted your feedback. Uh, I've put the feedback code in the chat uh, section. So if you haven't received it, then uh, do look over there. And next week's lecture is on Halix Valgus, a logical approach by Callum Clark, um, which is on Wednesday, 20th of October. So we'll see you then. Thanks for joining.